If you're a fan of this show, then you know we already did a tomato episode. But then I realized we needed to do a part two. Why? Because I tasted these. Meet the tomatoes with the genetic flavor advantage. So we've already showed you how processing tomatoes grow, the kind that go into sauce and soup. But there's a whole tomato world beyond the ruby red ones that dominate the commercial tomato industry. And we're about to discover how these other tomatoes are scientifically sweeter than any of those perfect red ones. So these funny looking tomatoes are not bred in a laboratory and they're not new. In fact, they're called heirloom tomatoes or heritage tomatoes. If you're in the UK. What makes them heirloom is that they haven't been crossed with any other variety, at least not for a long time, usually decades, sometimes centuries. Think of an heirloom like a thoroughbred, a purebred. There are all kinds of fruits and vegetables that are heirlooms, but just in tomatoes alone, there are more than 15,000 known varieties of heirlooms, with only about 3,000 of them being grown today. Okay, so most of us know tomatoes that look like this, the classic red round. They're the ones that rule our supermarkets. They're hybrids. They're the result of crossbreeding, an age-old technique, nothing nefarious here. It's just humans moving pollen from one plant to another. For example, say you get a tomato that has a thick skin and doesn't bruise easily, and you cross it with a variety that's more disease resistant. You get a new variety that hopefully contains both traits. Well, guess what? That selective breeding has essentially brought us to one homogenous product, tomatoes that all pretty much look and taste the same. We've gone from that incredible diversity of tomatoes to just this. There are farmers who have gone against the tide, like H.G. Haskell, a third generation farmer in Chadsford, Pennsylvania. He grows over 75 varieties of heirloom tomatoes on one of the most beautiful historic farms I've ever seen in this country. And I've seen a lot of farms. HG, as everybody calls him, runs a farm stand that's like a cult favorite in this area. But he doesn't sell to supermarkets because heirlooms bleed money. Heirlooms are a nightmare to grow and a headache to harvest. The plants don't even produce a lot of tomatoes. They're highly susceptible to disease. The fruit is extremely fragile. They bruise when you pick them, they bruise when you move them, and they crack at the first sight of rain. They're like a water balloon with needles underneath them. No matter <laughs> what you do, something's gonna go wrong. Right. Yeah, you can't pile on top of each other, you can't bounce them around. Yes. But the flip side of that is the flavor is fantastic. So what percentage would you say do you actually sell of your heirloom crop? On average, 10 to 20%. So you're losing money with heirlooms? Most likely, yeah. I mean, unless you have the absolute perfect weather and everything sells the second it gets to the table, but that doesn't ever often happen. happen. Yeah. <laughs> Has it ever happened? I, not yet. <laughs> okay, fingers crossed for this year. Yes. So now we get to the twist in the story. The only way for a tomato to flourish as a commercial crop at all was to become more uniform, more predictable, more robust. And so about 70 years ago, crop breeders discovered a mutation that turned the tomato a brilliant solid red. Not like this thing. It was easy to know when a red tomato was ripe. It was attractive to consumers, more attractive than these gnarly looking heirlooms. And so they started 
breeding that mutation into all the commercial tomatoes, not with genetic modification, just classic crossbreeding like we talked about earlier. But what breeders didn't know until only a few years ago is that that mutation knocked out a gene necessary for the full development of the tomato's sugars. Can you believe that? They essentially sacrificed flavor for some stupid cosmetic ideal. Like anything in this country, yeah. customers like perfect, yes. and there aren't perfect heirlooms. And, you know, the, the regular tomatoes that the grocery stores sell. Yeah. The hybrids. They've been bred so they don't crack. Super thick skin that you can peel off like leather. Yeah, which you don't look forward to at no, all. No, you want it out of there. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas this, I just want to eat it like an apple. Yep. Just. Unlike hybrid tomatoes, heirlooms have true seeds. That means you can take the seeds out of an heirloom, plant them, and they will grow the same tomato. You can't do that with a store-bought hybrid. HG reserves a portion of his heirloom crop each year just to harvest the seeds. Those seeds will become a future crop of tomatoes. One thing that strikes me about HG's farm is that the heirlooms haven't been planted in tidy rows of single varieties. Pineapple tomatoes are interspersed with giant Peruvians. Pink brandy wines next to rabbit feet. Wait, rabbit feet? Oh my God, this looks like a pepper. Yeah, but it is really a kind of plum tomato. Somebody gave me the seed uh, about 25 years ago yeah. and I forgot who it was and I found the seed. And the first year I grew it, I said, eh, it looks like a rabbit's foot. So I called it a rabbit's foot. So wait, you've named it rabbit's foot. Yes. Oh, I love it. So this is an HG special right here. Yeah. You know, being in your fields, looking at varieties I've never seen before, it just blows my mind at the diversity that we don't see in our grocery stores. And that is all to do with profitability. Yeah. Because, I mean, and, you know, nothing against the grocery stores, but they have to grow stuff that they can make money on if they want to stay in business. Absolutely. And we grow a lot of heirloom tomatoes, but it's only 5% of what oh, we yeah. grow. HG's farm is not certified organic, but his work is guided by solid, sustainable principles. After starting his heirloom plants in the greenhouse, he transfers them to the field, where he feeds them expensive organic fertilizer. He also shields them in open-sided high tunnels to create the kind of warm, dry environment tomatoes love. Those desert-like conditions come with their own challenges, like spider mites. HG says he uses pesticides as a very last resort. Instead, he combats the spider mites by introducing his own predatory bugs, which like to feast on the spider mites. Because HG sells his tomatoes right at his own farm stand, his customers get a rare treat, tomatoes that are truly picked ripe right from the field next door. So when I go to a supermarket and it says vine ripened, is that like vine ripened that you have here? No, the tomato industry has a term they call vine ripened. That means when the tomato starts to show color, any color other than green, it's considered vine ripe. So they can pick it and then off the vine, it will eventually ripen, but it hasn't fully ripened on the vine. Like we pick ours, red or depending on the heirloom, whatever color it's supposed to be. Right. And so you have another four, five, ten days of ripening than you would for a vine ripe that you might find in the supermarket. And ripening equates to flavor. Correct. Right. And nutrients, so they say. The tomato industry would dispute that with you, but <laughs> there are studies that say it's more nutritious if it's vine ripened. Really? I mean, if it's ripened on, on the, the vine. vine. <laughs> Not fine ripened. Correct. Yeah. We're talking, of course, about the fresh market here. The tomatoes grown for cans and sauces, as we learned in our episode on processing tomatoes, are indeed picked ripe from the vine. I have a confession to make. I used to wonder whether some people's obsession with heirlooms 
was really just a romantic fantasy. You know, that old trope that things were better in the good old days. Well, since immersing myself in this world of agriculture, I've realized that heirlooms represent a diversity that's being lost in modern agriculture. 75% of the world's crop diversity has disappeared in just the last 100 years. That's staggering. It's because our food system focuses on monoculture and uniformity. Now, I get the business angle. It's scalable, it's predictable, it's profitable, I get it. But the reality is we've lost so many foods, foods that are way more nutritious, way more flavorful than anything being grown today, foods that you and I will never get to eat, unless you're lucky enough to live near a farm like this.